screen in the middle. Oh, uh, you mean this one? Yeah. That, you could break that one off, yeah. Oh, look oh, at that. There, there you we go. go. That's Good some, eye. some crest. All right. Can I do a little rotisserie? Testing off the sediment. And some oxidation patches. Yeah, really weathered, but why not? Looks good. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Don't lose it. Fortunately, it's very flat here. We're not working on a steep slope, so it's not gone forever. It didn't go too far. Uh, is that one? I don't know. Oh, it's right there. I think it's okay. Yeah, that's yep. it. So. Oh, that orangey color, when you say weathered, is that like iron oxide? What, what are we looking at there? Yeah, pretty much just iron oxidation. Yeah. We can put that in the uh, sample sample? starboard bio box, uh, C. What's that? Yeah. Any floaty bits in there? What have we got in there? Just rocks? Just rocks. Okay. I was just thinking, um, back in undergrad, I learned about so many different types of, like Steve's been sharing all these different types of corals. So it can go into C, and D, or I F. I learned about three types of rocks. with more study would I begin to appreciate the diversity of rocks <laughs> I know I do yeah. yeah oh wow what what a great rock right there there's actually a lot of cool stuff here what nice you, nice sonar seeing? target what are you seeing? that's cool we'll find out I just see sh shadows of things so Potential. Potential. Lots cool of things. potential. Let's go Thank you. Uh -huh. It's rain right outside. Whatever it's called. Ooh, we so we've got a bunch of these Ooh. stalked crinoids here. This is um, Proisocrinus. They look like fireworks. Yep. Did you want to go for one of these rocks again, Steve? Uh, no, I think, well, uh, unless we see something really obvious, but I think we'll hold off. Okay. This one actually looks pretty interesting in the back, but can we zoom on this first, this little red stick little right red there stick. with yep. two white patches on it? Let me get over there. Your eyes is incredible, Steve. <laughs> Spend a lot of time looking at the seafloor. You start to pick out things. I think it's just a price of Krenis stock, but um, just to check, it's kind of a snap zoom is enough. We don't need to okay. get a stable shot. Okay, you can go ahead and zoom there, Timmy. Okay. Yep. All right. Great, thanks. That's about it. I just wanted to confirm that it was a Krenis stock. Okay. Looks good. That was one zero meters. Zero four five rudder. Bridge nav. One zero meters bearing zero four five. Uh, I mean, we 
We could. We could take another one. Okay. Um, yeah, could we lateral to right? Or if we move up slope a little bit, maybe get a little bit of a different depth. Get around. There was that. Are you interested in looking at that rock again? Yeah, can we lateral off to the right yeah. here? I'm just trying not to smush those crinoids that are over there, just out of view. Okay, now they're pretty tall. Yeah. Was it the one sort of to the left of those three? Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> that's a tough spot, right? Uh, you're good over there. So I got a couple candidates here. I was thinking yeah. you got one there, one there, and worst case scenario, maybe one here, but then you've got the sponge to contend with. So I was thinking this one first, and then maybe one of these second. Okay. For the viewer that was asking about that stock that Steve zoomed into, I think that was a crinoid stock. Yeah, yeah. So the stock of some one of these in front of us right now. Yeah. I'm not sure what a, what could have caused it to break like that. Um, they don't usually just break off for no reason. It could have been predation or something like that. Uh, and it caused it to detach. Oh right. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay, so looks like I'm stable there. Um, do you want to give that rock a poke? Yeah. The one in the center, right, Steve? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Ready for your craft? Oh, you got it. Okay. So that would, uh, we have four, now four rocks. This will be rock number five. And uh, we only got maybe one or two larger outcroppings coming up, so might as well just yeah, take them now. We've never actually reached our limit. Oh, what about just above it? Okay. Yeah, I think these are, a lot of these are really... Pretty well attached, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what about the one slightly upslope? By that sponge? This one? Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Any chance you can yeah. uh, move around and maybe touch this one here or, or this one there? I really think those <laughs> crinoids are absolutely beautiful. Science. They look like underwater flowers. I really love them. I'm going to go for the one by the sponge first, Dan. Give it a, do you want to give it a flying poke? <laughs> that that sponge is going to be really brittle. So just okay. Um, careful. Let's see. Oh no. I'm not sure it was done. Let's see. You're going to be able to poke around the sponge, Dan. Okay. Oh no. Is that a shallow water shell on the bottom left? Oh. Now it's left of the lasers. Shallow water, what is it? Sh shell? Uh, you mean this thing? Yeah. Okay. I don't know, I think that might either be debris or part of a sponge. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Look like the back of like a conch or something, but. No, I see what you mean. Yeah, maybe sponge. That's a little warm. <laughs> wow. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's angles. a really precarious spot. Yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Take out the sponge while we're trying to get the rock. I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Okay. Um, we'll just look at the one that was just a little to the left. The, that. 
Yeah, I, th I think just I. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll we'll skip the that rock. Okay. And just yeah, it looks like it'll be attached. Keep going up uh, a little bit. Follow this feature. Let's see what we see. Let's see what we see. Hopefully, more of those crinoids. They were really pretty, like a bouquet of deep sea flowers in the morning. Yeah. Hard, hard to believe, but the crinoids are in the same grouping as sea stars and sea cucumbers and sea urchins and the phylum Echinodermata. Oh, I did not know that. This, yeah. this looks a little cool. bit different. Can we look at this one over here? Yeah. Dan was right yesterday when he was talking about coral biologists love yellow fans because they all look different. <laughs> they might actually be different, that's why we have to spend a lot of time looking at them. Uh, I think one example was uh, last year in the Howland and Baker area, we sampled on one dive, like six or seven yellow s yellow fans and like three or four of them, uh, they, they all looked identical on the seafloor and three or four of them uh, were different species. <laughs> Slightly different sclerite morphologies in the polyps. Do you ever get a sense of like what percent difference the DNA is oh, between it's, those? Oh, it's very small. Okay. It's it's really really small. Yeah, that's. So th yeah, this is this is definitely different uh, from our previous yellow fan. Um, take a look here. Can we tilt up a little bit towards the top of the colony? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It looked really looked like a, it was a little bit easier to discern some features at the top with the light. Oh my gosh. Sorry. It's a bit spicy on that up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, how would you feel about doing a small snip of this one too? Okay. Yep. Looks good. Yep. Okay. So this will be Plexorid species two. Two uh, within the same hour. Yeah. Some somewhere like yeah, one of these branches, something like that, or you know, even something like this is fine. Just turn the bender on, you have to turn it back even off. even a little bit off the top. Right there. You can push in there, Tammy. It's off. So the, these plexorids... Um, can you zoom in somewhat? They start appearing around 2,000 meters. I think we set a depth record multiple times last year for deepest uh, observed plexorid in the Central Pacific, around 2,000 meters. Um, but in this particular part of the world, south of Talk Hawaii, there's a, they're a little bit more poorly known, so having collections of these helps us understand their diversity. Really hard to pick out when you're doing analysis of video different species of plexorids, so oftentimes they just get lumped because we can't really discern one from another. So if these are different, we should expect to see both of the different plexorid DNA uh, in the Niskin samples? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, theoretically. Uh, we do know that they're detectab detectable by DNA.
polyps closed on that side, but they're still open on the other, at the very top. That looks good, Dan. Right And, you know, we, we don't really need to take a lot of material, but we, need to do, we do need to take enough because, you know, these samples are going to hopefully go into a museum where they can um, be useful for scientists for, you know, decades and decades, um, maybe centuries. You know, we're still referring to collections from the Challenger expedition in the 1800s. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, on a regular basis, even actually more now than ever, because we're finding that a lot of the places we're visiting haven't been visited since the di since those days. Where so is that collection located? That's at the Natural History Museum in London. But every every country has got their you know archives of collections. Um, A lot of uh, the U.S. collections are housed at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. Um, in this case, our collections are going to MCZ, uh, Harvard's Museum of Zoology. Huh. Steve, where do we want to put this one? Um, yeah, uh, we can put it in here with this carbonate rock, rock, maybe? Right? Or do you want to put it in the uh, other forward box? Let's, let's put it in the other forward box. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to uh, really box out? Yeah. Want your porch light? Sure. Ooh, whoops. Sorry, Tammy. So I'm looking at the two colonies now side by side. The one that's in the left box and the one that's in the right box. The one we just sampled is a little bit more ro uh, robust. And the other one on, on the left-hand side was definitely a lot more you know, fragile, thin thin branches. It'd be very interesting to see how the polyps uh, and sclerites differ in okay. these two colonies. Because presumably if you were looking at these in video, they would look rather similar. And you might suspect they're on the same rock. They're not right next to each other. It's probably the same. But uh, you know, this is one thing we're really trying to clarify in the coral world is what's the diversity within a landscape. Turning off the porch light. Great, thanks for that collection. I think we can move on. Down. Moving on. Oh, winch up. All right. Are we good to move on with the ship moving, or you want to stay stationary around this area? We'll hang out here for a minute until we get to tether off of Argus. Roger. Steve, are you looking for any more samples here? Uh, no, I think we're just going to track the rock up um, for as long as it as long as it goes. No. Okay. Just coming up and. Doink in there. Uh, how's the weather doing on the ships? Uh, what are we at for wind? Uh, we're at 14 knots. There was a squall that just moved through. It was pouring down rain for a bit. Oh, it's not ours. <laughs> Follow the rocks. No, follow, chase the rocks up. Follow the crusty rock road. <laughs> Watch your sonar and uh, Argus view and look for cool stuff. 
And that cool stuff. Cool stuff. We want cool sciencey yep. stuff. Um, I mean, okay. Steve, we got a question coming in for Steve's got the and Rebecca. I'll tell you where Something cool up there, maybe. Okay. No, but like, are we going to do something about that or? No, don't okay. worry about it. Okay. Okay. How are the samples preserved for use in the future? Yeah. So uh, we, we can't just ship them back in, in seawater. Um, we are doing something about it. You know, we want to make sure that they're preserved and that their their DNA is preserved. So you know, scientists who are interested in that can look at it. Um, but for the most part, uh, we on the ship here will use uh, alcohol, ethanol. Yeah, can we zoom on this uh, pink? So we'll use ethanol, high, high concentration, high proof ethanol. Um, in the case of gelatinous organisms, we might use formalin to preserve tissues and harden them a bit uh, so they don't turn into mush. Uh, but those are the primary two chemicals we'll use. And then if we don't want to use those chemicals or if we want to do something else, we can preserve uh, specimens whole also uh, with freeze, uh, by freezing them. For rocks, we just let them dry and we put them in a bag and we ship them to the repository. Oh, a lot less prep there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated, yeah. Unless for some of the rock samples that are our candidates for microbial Go studies. Ahead, Zoom, That's true. Those ones will uh, be rinsed in DI water and then put in a little baggie and stuck in the negative 80 degree freezer and then they get shipped. Got Great. it. Yeah. So this is Paragorgia. And. Over. Uh, this is a species that's known from this area. Um, well, a genus at least, Paragorgia. We're not going to sample this. We're just going to take a quick screen grab because we sampled it in 2019 at 1,700 meters, so right about where we are now. Okay. So uh, we can zoom out and then go off to the left. There's another pink coral, pink-red coral colony that uh, looked a little bit different. So directly lateral left, right okay. here. Do we know anything about if there's a reason for the diversity in color of deep sea corals? I wish I could give you a good answer, but there really isn't. Um, we know that a lot of different colonies may express many different colors. Uh, so it, it, it could be a number of factors from you know, diet, consumption, uh, to just maybe their age in some cases. They express different uh, pigments and different compounds, different times of their life. And then the density of the of those compounds too, it's important. I wonder if there's a different, you know, energy cost associated with different types of pigments. I'm sure, yeah. So, uh, at least with the plexors, a lot of yellows and reds. Um, Go ahead and zoom there, Tammy. Which could be related to their ancestry. All right, so this is what I was talking about before about these plexorids. So this is um, this is also a plexorid, and this one is called Swiftia. And this is what I thought that first yes. plexorid colony we had was. It has yellow polyps, but it's pink red. And I'm just trying to make sure and see if we have Swiftia from this area. Just give me a second. Okay, so. Uh, All right, Dan, uh, or Pilot, uh, I think we're going to go for a clip of this one as well. So this would be our third plexorid species for this one rock, which is pretty nice. I think we'll take a, just a small enough s snip that we can maybe slurp it up. 
Oh, look at, actually, look at the base of this, if we can, before we go. I want to point out something else. There are these small little squiggly worms here. These are actually aplacophorans. These are predators of corals. Kind of look nondescript, almost like they blend into the sediment. But yeah, those are voracious coral predators. Although you usually find a couple of them around a rock, for example, um, around the base of a colony. But uh, yeah. Can the coral defend itself in any way? Uh, not really. No? no. At least not that I'm aware of. I mean, there might be chemical defenses we're not aware of uh, until we look at those types of things and ask those types of questions. But uh, mechanically, I don't think there's any defense like that um, that I'm aware of. What are these worms called, one more time? Aplacophorans. All right. A placo, P H O R A N S, forens. Mm -hmm. They're a type of mollusk. Shellless mollusk. So this one is a Swiftia? Swiftia, yeah. Uh, j just, yeah, maybe a few centimeters, you know, something like that from the branches. That would be nice. So either you know, part of this or part of that, whatever. So we, we, there has been a Swiftia sampled from this area, but it's been at a much shallower depth and it's most certainly a different species collected from 466 meters. Um, but that Swiftia species is much more highly branching and much more... Um, you turn on the porch light? Yep. Porch light coming on, Tammy. Much more dense polyps. Now I can see. This one is uh, what we would typically call like a sparse branching Swiftia. Um. But we also see Swiftia um, with white, uh, that's completely white, um, which we, <laughs> we just call white Swiftia because honestly we have no idea how to tell them apart uh, other than their coloration pattern sometimes. I think that's enough, Steve. Yeah, yeah, what do you got? Like maybe a few centimeters? Yeah. Uh, a little, I can try more, the top a little bit more. Want more. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm only asking because, uh, you know, these these are corals will be destructively sampled, so we'll need to take a little a few polyps to do DNA analysis. And if we can have a little bit more material, it provides a little bit of a reference. i get a couple branches here if I have to go down and. Yeah, that, that's much better. That's great. All right, there you go, Swift. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. So when there's a ferocious predator nearby a coral, shake it does off. that mean the coral shake is doomed? Off. And how long <laughs> does it have before it uh, gets consumed? That's always a great question. We only see snapshots of predation um, in the field. We only see snapshots of predation, so you know it, it's definitely been observed before that there might be uh, a coral might be predated upon by a sea star for years and years. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of like uh, I don't know, to draw to draw a comparison to uh, something we were talking about the other day. Um, you know, from Star Wars, like being digested alive in the belly of the sarlacc for thousands of years <laughs> um, but it's actually just being predated upon by a sea star where do you where do you want to put this uh yeah do you want can to we slurp, slurp it, up? it or yeah. uh, we can yeah yeah let's do that right there. slurp number three is open slurp number three snip and slurp i feel like that should be the name of a convenient store <laughs> It is a convenience store, <laughs> Coral convenience store. <laughs> it's called the four to eight, four to eight watch, the pit slurp. Yeah, what jar are we on there? Uh, it's three, but I don't know if it's, it's flushed so out. The way they serve slurpees or ices. Exactly. Do you want us to Slur flush um, it out there, Steve? Ices. Go back to the flush ices. jar. Also. I'm a fan of the icy. Okay. I, I think ices are better than yeah, slurpees. Yeah, best it's being, it's okay, it's behaving a little better now. I'm curious, what are some of the common characteristics of corals found in Plexiuridae? 
common characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, with the Plex um, the they all share kind of a um, combination skeleton that's mostly proteinaceous. It often feels very fibrous. You can zoom it's in on the coral if you want, Tammy. It's going to take a second to flush here. It's a type of protein. It uh, gives it a lot of flexibility, as you saw. These corals were, were very flexible, moving around the arm, you know, the um, branches, so it allows Dan to get in there and Flushing. cut, um, you know, very precision uh, fragments, but um, there's also calcium carbonate oh, elements, flushing. like the sclerites inside the body of the polyp. Um, so they have you know, multiple different kind of skeleta, skeleton, okay. uh, um, I skeletal composition. Seven. So that, Six, that the skeleton, five, uh, three. Uh, composition is one of the characteristics, kind of unites all the plexorids. Um, coloration pattern is usually something too, they're usually highly pigmented. Um, I need to adjust that camera. In rare cases they're all white um, or opaque. Uh, but in beyond that they have uh, fairly similar sclerite morphologies around the polyp. About three. Yep. So the sclerites are these calcium carbonate kind of shards. Okay, you want to uh, tilt down into the right. And they're so arranged in such a way yeah, that they're more similar down. among us all the plexorids. They kind of form a ring around the um, down. polyp itself. But there's many, many different types of um, plexorid sclerite yeah. morphologies. Yeah, I was just kind of looking through and they look so different. <laughs> so that's yeah. why I was like, hmm, I wonder what, what the common trend is. So it's that fibrous. Come in a bit, please. Yeah, it's, it, that, that's the, that's that's one the of them. predominant characteristic. Yeah, okay. it's, it's fibrous, proteinaceous uh, skeleton. Go give us, uh, what did we do here last time? 50, 75? We get that's, this question a lot. That's um, 50. It's been pulled in. How old are these species of, of coral? Cofer 75, just okay. at the start there. How old are they? Um, yeah. Very difficult to tell in the case of plexorids, yeah. Um, do they to have growth rings? <laughs> yeah, to know for sure, you could do that analysis, but you would need the base of it, so you'd need to kill the whole colony um, using the methods we currently yeah, have. There's no, that protein is not really datable uh, in a way that you know, calcium carbonate jar, is for a hard coral. Move yeah. your camera back to where some happy spot. Good collection, thank you, front row. S snip and slurp complete. Well done. Mm -hmm. Quick off topic, Jordan. What's your favorite flavor? Uh, Vices. Yes. So there's the Malona flavor that our local Target has, which is pretty delicious. Uh, but when I'm at the movie theater, I generally mix cherry and the Coke flavor to give myself a nice cherry Coke icy. Oh, that's the best. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember there's a crack seed store growing up where they would do icy floats. So it was like ice cream. And then you would do the strawberry oh. icy on top, which is really good. Sorry. Oh, that was me. What about you? That kind of reminds me of the shaved ice on top of ice cream. Mm. Then you got to get a snow cap on top of that. What's that? Snow cap, condensed milk. Oh, snap. <laughs> Haven't done that before. <laughs> Let's see here. A couple, uh, couple of questions coming in. Those worms, those predatory worms you, uh, are real slow moving. Unless Steve sees something, that, see the sharp bit to your left there? Right I'm going to go ahead and say that many animals that live in the deep are slow movers because they want to nice and slow. Help. effectively use energy. Yeah, there's a bit of an overhang there. Yeah. Definitely could be a long time between uh, meals for a lot of these animals. So they typically have very slow metabolisms very slow growth rates. Do you think that, let's see if I can kind of get this question in. 
deep sea corals compared to surface or shallow corals. I don't see much which there. Go look at the other side then. Uh, older or long living or something. Maybe. How old? <laughs> like where I just came from? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you, you could make an argument that um, for, stuff. for one or the other. Look at one side um, and the other. Before we move. If you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about um, yeah, individual colonies. Um, you know, I, I know there are some bamboo corals that can probably be in several hundreds of years old, um, but if you're talking about like the reef, the reef structure corals. overall, yeah, those are probably on the order of maybe tens of thousands of I'll years old. I'll take another ten, Sam, zero, four, five. Um, but a Roger. lot of these deep water corals, once they're attached, they, uh, they you know, if, unless there's something to predate upon them or dislodge them or anything like that, they will just continue to grow. Uh, so, you know, they, they could be, they could be decades to, to uh, maybe even centuries old in some cases. Got it. They were wondering if the environment in the deep ocean is more stable than the environments on the surface or in the shallow ocean. And therefore, would that be a reason that the deep sea has more older species. Can we go to just pan to the right a little bit? I thought I saw a rock that might yeah. have been yeah, a good so. candidate. Kind of got asked the same question, like with shallow reef corals, they're like good rock? more subject to okay. Can we the effects to of like this rock here? warming weather yeah. and yeah. climate change. It. Whereas for deep sea corals, are they more are in more are they more of a stable environment? It it is stable. Um, in that, you know, there's not as much effects like seasonality or temperature changes. Ooh. Oh, that's a good right. rock, right? Yeah. Do we want a ship stop? Uh, yeah, can we no. grab that rock? Roger. Yeah, I'll we'll grab it. I'll let Antonella sit down there. I could probably grab it on the flight. Good grab. Nice. You can uh, open the box while you're... Okay. Starboard box? Yeah, yep. starboard box. You can put it into F. F, roger. Want your sample solo? Which one is F? No, oh, that's good. You yeah. can continue to look around there. Okay. Store it. Yeah, uh, so uh, more stable in the terms of you know, less seasonal seasonality in terms of temperature fluctuations, oh. things like that. But um, sponge there, you know, yeah, you never know when there are going to be food food pulses and things like that that uh, might you know be the best signal of you know seasonality or uh, oh, periodicity right that here. animals have in the deep sea. So yeah, se seasonal in terms of you know you're not going to have a lot of Perhaps uh, changes to the landscape, but you know there could be once in a while you get these benthic storms, you know, sediments, essentially like avalanches under the sea. Uh, sediments are destabilized, and they may provide significant disruption. But I don't think it's completely decoupled because. Are you this particular in? deep sea environment is dependent on what's happening at the zoomed in, quite in a the shallow. Oh. Yeah. So hey, Tammy, yeah, are you certainly. Full wide? I think it's going to be coupled. Ah, we'll eventually you. see. Yeah, she wasn't in that part. They're connected. Yeah. Yeah, you can make an argument that um, you know the deep sea as we see it today, uh, even in certain you know, chemosynthetic communities, perhaps, uh, or at least the, s the communities that are supported by chemosynthetic ecosystems and microbes uh, are also dependent on the surface ocean to some degree because, uh, you know, as far as we know, there's no oxygen being produced around, uh, you know, these chemosynthetic habitats and oxygen comes from circulation from the surface ocean. So, 
Yeah, I think uh, unless you're a microbe making away from uh, making your life from uh, reduced Under chemicals 10, please, that are coming Sam. out of the ocean floor, Roger. everybody up. needs oxygen. Pretty One much. zero meters, bearing zero four five. But there are microbes that don't. Yep. Which is kind of a cool thing. And um, one of the the targets for exploration on potential oceans on other planetary bodies. Maybe looking for that type of life or quote unquote weird life, stuff that doesn't use oxygen. Yeah. Question coming in, is there a site where we can re-watch previous live streams? I'd love to see the streams from previous come days. Around to your right um, there. Like I know we have a YouTube out. site, and I believe all of them Might are... Might get action. Don't or do, because I don't look at there. YouTube. Am I right on about that, Tammy? Like, I would. So, yeah. yeah. Check things out on YouTube. dark on the right, maybe. Yeah, I see that. Um, yep, all of our oh, dives are on YouTube. Um, and also, if you're on the live stream at any time, you can rewind it up to 12 hours um, while it's going live. And then since 2019, all of our dives have been recorded and uploaded in full on YouTube. So check out our YouTube channel. And if you're watching right now and want to see something oh, yeah, from the nice last 12 here, hours, yeah. you can uh, rewind. This is where we just were. Yeah, that's the same. Is amount. rewind still but a thing? Chase it around to the right. Back yeah. Never seemed to be <laughs> on the right. <laughs> well, they understand what that word means. We, I used, mean, to, we used to press the rewind. Rewind, button. absolutely. There used to be whole machines dedicated to rewinding. Yeah. yeah. Those were the good days. I remember video stores would fine you for not rewinding your video, your VHS yeah. tape. Yeah. Actually, this, this kind of looks like a pillow. I don't know, maybe I'm seeing things. Pillow lava. Steve circled maybe. something there he wants to see. Oops. Okay. Uh, I did something. Got it, got it. What are you looking at there, Steve? I, uh, my telestrator disconnected something or other. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Sorry. I think it was the rock that your lasers are on. Yeah, that one. I was, I was trying to, I was saying it kind that of looked one. like a pillow, but I wanted to get Rebecca's input. It kind of does. It looks like a chunk's been broken off yeah. out the, off the bottom. You want to poke it? Right. Sorry, no, I missed that. No, I'm just making an observation. No. Roger. Okay. Keep going to your right. There's yeah. a big hole you can fly a herc into. Yeah, some of these rocks have looked like uh, some pillows, some flows, so maybe. Yeah, so it says NDI video disconnected. That ship move is complete. Roger. I don't think I touched anything. Yeah, my, my video is frozen. Maybe it's the input. Okay. Yep. Working on it. All right, connected. Perfect, that works. Got a question coming in. I'm wondering about the amount of marine snow um, and how is it that the deep sea's not just completely covered in sediment during the previous hundreds of thousands of years? How is it not a huge sediment desert? Most of the ocean is uh, definitely, uh, they have a lot of abyssal plain. Um, but you also have a lot of areas like these seamounts that are um, 
you know, they have rapid currents that you know kind of scour away sediment, keep the sediment down. Uh, but uh, there's also just generally a rather slow sedimentation rate in the, these parts of the ocean uh, where you have low productivity, for example, or lower productivity. Um, sedimentation rates might be on the order of you know, millimeters per thousands of years. Millimeters per thousands of years? Yeah, millimeters wow. per thousands or maybe centimeters per thousands, depending on where you are. But then you also have, you know, places like uh, upwelling zones in the west coast, for example, where you might have, you know, a centimeter or so in a couple, in a few years, depending on what type of uh, production has been going on. Some nice crusts here. Yeah. Botryoidal textures. Bumpy. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a few critters straight ahead. We'll see him at Argus on the. This is turning out to be a nice, feature nice little uh, feature yeah. here. It's incredible because looking in the Argus view, you just see how lucky we are. It's like sediment desert on either side of this, but you, it actually kind of proves a point here and to show that a lot of species really need this hard bottom to. Uh, to live, attach. Are we still kind of working our way across the terrace a little bit? Because um, yeah. I noticed that we haven't really changed our depth all too much. Yeah, on, that, that's uh, kind of on purpose, but Bumping. also at the yeah. same time, uh, We're trying to maximize our investigation of this site. The diversity is pretty substantial, uh, I was at. Um, but we will we'll be getting shallower. We only have about 500 meters or more to go gotcha. shallower, maybe 400 meters at this point. But it will turn to sediment eventually. This is just a small outcrop. So what species of coral is this again? I know we saw one yesterday. Yeah, this the other is... Day. This is a okay. coral called a so uh, 4K there too. You got right on that. Yeah. Aridogorgia magna spiralis. It's got a very odd orange tentacles. I wonder if those are actually uh, center. I zoom on those orange tentacles if you have stability. Yeah, we'll do the dual zoom here. Yeah, you can perch right I'm thinking there. those might be benthic tenophorus. They sometimes attach to these uh, branches of the coral colonies and feed into the uh, into the flow. You gotta wait till the vehicle Park. stops moving before you press that button. I thought it had. Was it? Can you zoom a little more on uh, Zeus, Tammy? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to get those orange ones, though, Steve. Yeah. Do you want to go back and look at them? Um, but yeah, I'd like to look at the orange ones, yeah. if you can, because I think they're a different animal entirely than the coral here. Okay. Oops. Great shot on the still cam there. Oh yeah, what happened to? Oh, I can't see the still camera right I'll now, put, so I'm not lighting anything up. up. Okay. No, no, we we we're we're just snapping photos as we go. Okay. Don't need to line up them specifically. Okay. I'm primarily looking at the Zeus cam. Ah, gotcha. Let's see if we can. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to perch here, so maybe you could see it in both Zeus and 4K. Uh, 
see the orangey bits. Just hold it, Antonella. Okay. Be better off. You can go ahead and zoom, Tammy. Yeah, there you go. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Way too spicy. There. Do you have any more? Sure do. Can you pan a little? Yeah, let me just try to get over there. I don't remember. Beautiful. I can't remember if it was a Sorry. coral or if Maybe it was an I... anemone, but someone's like, what is that thing that looks like Tina Turner's hair? And I can't remember what it is now. I think it was a sea it was cucumber. Sea cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> sea cucumber. <laughs> 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 we got it. We got it. What are we looking at here, Steve? Yeah. So uh, these are um, two branches of an Eritogorgia colony that have been completely taken over by this uh, benthic tenophore. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see that the tenophores are several in a row here, but they have these oh, long right. tentacles extending off, which they kind of use like fishing lures to capture oh. particles out of the water column. Go ahead and zoom on really the 4K neat. down if you want a little. Um, right. they, these are really poorly known, uh, but there's a few genera. Um, the, mo the one we most commonly see at these depths is called Tialfiella, uh, but I, this one might be different. Uh, but it looks like, actually, the, the tenophore is kind of you know, partially taken over these branches. They're so live coral polyps, which is amazing that the coral polyps are able to subsist after being taken over in part by these uh, tenophores. Really great imagery. Wow. That's cool. You can even see their little lines. Yeah. So they, they retract their tentacles, kind of like reeling in a fishing line uh, t to feed. Uh, but it, what's more surprising is I've never seen this before, that you know, the, the branches still have live coral polyps on them. So it's like kind of like a shared yeah, It's shared like every setup. other. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. All set. Come on. Stunning images. Thank you. Fancy flying. I like it. Yeah. That looks like a firework. So, h where does this? Uh, how how, how is this oriented right? in the in the slope? Does it extend? Right. Is it upslope, downslope oriented, or looks to me like? Uh, Can you repeat the question, Steve? Yeah. How is it oriented? Ah. Uh, uh, right now. Northeast, southwest? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a really amazing little feature we come across here. Um, yeah, I'm happy to continue up uh, along it. Up. Yeah, when uh, pilots are ready. Yep. Is that a yep from Antonella? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. We'll uh, stretch it out a little before you start moving the ship. Roger. Let me know when good. Some new questions coming in. Um, what big picture questions are we hoping to answer on this expedition? Like and what this Steve's side? saying, you could move a little faster up the hill there. Okay. There are there any specific five. questions the scientists on the expedition are interested in answering? So for some of the geologists on this expedition, they're looking to date some of the volcanic material to get a better sense of uh, the ages of these seamounts that we've been exploring. Um, other geologists want to look at these ferromanganese crusts um, alongside the 
water column data that we're collecting, so things like dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature, um, to see if there are any trends between those conditions and the uh, concentration of trace metals in these crusts. Um, yeah. Okay, Sam, we'll take 20 this time. So Roger, 045. Zero, zero, four, five. Five. Yeah, Roger. Bridge now. Two zero meters, bearing zero four five. Time flies when you're sampling corals and rocks. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we've gotten a lot so far. Our whole watch, we've come like 40 <laughs> meters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. They tracked quite a bit on the last watch, which we'll, we'll take an average. Depends on Seems who you are. Be, uh, Time flies for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be more critters on the uh, on the right side of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a little interested in uh, this critter here, that kind of puff ball okay. to the right of the crinoid. But we don't, you know, we just can look at it in passing. We don't have to stop the ship for it. Roger, ship move underway. This is kind of the depth, you know, 1,500 to about 2,400 meters. This is the depth where we typically find uh, what's called the uh, mid bathial diversity maximum for deep water species. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me all that much that this is where we're finding a lot of the corals and sponges that we're interested in. Diversities will uh, actually ex uh, go down a little bit uh, as we approach the kind of thousand meters or so, but as you get shallower than that, they start to pick up again, as we saw yesterday during our dive at Shallow Kingman. Zoom in on that puffball, Tim. Yeah. So this is a. This is a, one. Actually, it's here this, you can see one of those free-living uh, brittle stars is probably looking for a new home. Uh -huh. Free-loading brittle star. Free-living. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's a good shot. We can uh, pull out. Okay. Uh, move on. So that's that's a species called Chrysogorgia. It's a golden coral. Uh, well, genus called Chrysogorgia. The species is probably either Chryseus or Stellata. There's two species that are very, very difficult to um, differentiate, at least by my eye. But that one looks a, like a little bit more like Stellata than Chryseus. Uh, so named because the polyps, when they close up, they kind of look like a starburst-shaped. Uh, they have very different sclerites than other members of the Chrysogorgid family, like the Eridogorgia, the spiral. I kind of like puffball coral. <laughs> yeah. a question coming in about the red star shaped flowers I believe that's the crinoids um, how old are they are those organisms how, how old tough to tell um, yeah I don't I don't know I think uh, probably have to consult the list about that oh, can we look at uh, snap zoom on what's under that ledge there yeah this like this that guy yeah yeah um, yeah, but I know they, they do contain possibly some datable elements light. in the stalk Porch of the crinoid. Yeah. Which are called Porch ossicles. Go ahead and zoom, Tammy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep doing that to you. Looks like a bunch of uh, maybe sponge stalks or something like that. 
You can see some pretty large amphipods on there. Actually, it's a massive amphipod right there. All right. It doesn't. It doesn't look like it's in good shape to me, but maybe no. Just <laughs> it's a pe peculiar high density too. Okay, thanks, pilot. Ready to go. Yeah. Okay, question coming in for Steve. Um, what is special or unique about the Mid Bathy region, such that it produces such biodiversity? Yeah, great question, and uh, that's kind of the topic of my one of my dissertation chapters. Uh, we have found that in this part of the Pacific, uh, and maybe even a bit further shallower, a uh, bit further south rather, that the mid bathial zone uh, is where you have uh, overlaps of different water masses. And e each of these water masses has slightly different species uh, assemblages associated with them. So certain species like to track uh, the conditions that are within certain water masses. Water masses are basically like layers in the ocean. Um, if you've ever done like the the oil and water experiment where you have separation layers according to density, water does that too, um, based on you know temperature and salinity variables uh, in the ocean. And those layers have different properties, like different oxygen concentrations uh, that might vary from those above or below. And so where you have areas where there are these water mass boundaries, you tend to have overlaps of species distributions. And it just so happens that in the middle of the bathial zone is where you have the greatest amount of species okay. distribution range overlaps. And so you have the greatest possible uh, diversity also in those areas. The ship that move is complete. Uh, the ship's just changing heading. Zero four five, Roger. Bridge now. Uh, two zero meters bearing zero four five. Uh, anything else on sonar coming up, or just uh... no? I'm just gonna start getting withdrawals from rocky <laughs> bottoms here. Yeah, that was a really cool rocky feature, though, with lots of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of samples. I have to look at the Zena Fire Force from now on. <laughs> yeah, there's still, still some plexors. No, no, we can move on. Okay. I'm just pointing out that that's kind of what we're going to be seeing for most of the sediment uh, stretch here. We've got a few things here. We've got um, an umbellopathies black coral there. Ooh, wow. What's that big guy? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It looks big. Yeah, we, we're going to want to take a piece of this, I think. Um, this is... Uh, this is, <laughs> this is possibly one of the bridge, sparse no? branchers, but I... Don't Hold position. know for sure, but oh, just bridge, in case. No, disregard. But just in case, we're going to take a small piece of this uh, bamboo coral. So Mary, uh, who was on the previous watch, I think. Yeah. Um, she's interested in bamboo corals and uh, specifically sparse branching bamboo corals. Um, I haven't seen a picture of the previous one they sampled, but to confer to make sure that we're not going to sample the same thing twice. What sample number was that? Let's see. 43. Mm-hmm. Huh, it's not showing up yet. What was the time, approximately? Do you have any yeah, okay. information on that? Yeah. 11.38 to 11.44. The 
but this is this is clearly a very old colony. You can tell because the the base of this colony, it's so thick. The the nodes, yeah, the nodes are being over calcified, uh, which is usually indicative of something that's very very ancient. So, we're gonna want to be careful around this colony. Uh, all we need is a branch tip or so, you know, maybe ten centimeters. Said eleven. 11 something? 1138. 38, got it. Uh, through 1144. Yeah. Oh yeah, they didn't, uh, that was a really great sparse brancher. Yeah, so this is a, this is, looks like a nodal branching colony and it looks like uh -huh. okay okay ship move is complete you might need to f uh how do you think you're going to tackle this one? You're going to fly up and snip a piece off? Okay. Okay, I think I'm perched there. Yeah. yeah, so I was just checking that. This is actually a different, possibly a different sparse branching colony from the one that was collected. Um, the one that was collected previously was definitely kind of like the true sparse brancher that she's most interested in, but this one still might be useful um, from a biodiversity perspective um, and then we'll see if uh, I know that the polyps here are definitely different in morphology than the ones that um, from the sample that was previously collected would they slurp that they did I'm pretty sure okay yeah yeah since it is a sparse branching colony we'll uh, we'll go for it when you sample you colonies do you typically sample below the node um it doesn't uh, the branch point or the node or the branch point i suppose That's where i was um y you can but you don't always have to uh, most of the information you need is you know can, you can get that information visually but most of what we're interested in is just the tissue and the polyps okay But what I'm trying to figure out here is, you know, is this maybe one of those sparse branchers, but um, it is, you know, just a lot older and maybe it's branched more often over the years. I wonder what you would do in order to try and get at that and answer that question. To, um, try and see if they're the same species yeah yeah so my understanding is that a lot of her work um, for her master's thesis is trying to look at the genetic differences between these species genetic and uh, morphological differences so what they'll do is um, they'll request uh, well they'll, they'll request a piece of this uh, coral from the uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology and maybe sequence some of its DNA by um, uh, yeah, basically extracting DNA from one of the polyps and then uh, amplifying it using a technique that we've all become very familiar with over the past few years called PCR. Uh, if you've ever had a COVID test, it's a PCR test. It's the same exact thing we do for uh, trying to determine species of corals and compare them genetically. We extract a bit of their DNA, we run it through PCR, which stands for polymer polymerase chain reaction. Uh, that expands and multiplies certain sections of the DNA so it can be e uh, adequately sequenced. For those of you just turning in, um, looks like we have a bamboo coral here. And one of our scientists on board is very interested in this particular type of coral. So we're lining up to take a small sample 
so that it can be investigated further. One of the, the questions behind her research is that uh, for a lot of these really long-lived colonies, we are not sure, um, you know, if they, uh, you know, when they branch in their life, you know, do they have to be a certain age before they start to branch? Sometimes they'll grow in what's called like a whip or uh, unbranched morphology, and then maybe they branch off a branch sometime, you know, towards the top of the colony late in life, or maybe it'll you know, it'll branch off somewhere low on the colony late in life, or it'll branch off very early in their life. It's it's not really understood, and to try and identify them morphologically is next to impossible because based on where they branch or when they branch, it might be one species or another. Bamboo corals are always some of the most striking in the deep sea. Uh, in these parts, because uh, a lot of a lot of the bamboo species, in fact, I think most all of them, except maybe a couple of them that are known from shallow waters um, in the genus Isis, uh, ex exist in the deep sea. So, primarily deep sea dwellers. But this, uh, the name of this family, used to be Isididae after the that species, Isis, but since uh, it's been revised after some years of work by uh, Mary's advisor and other colleagues about kind of the diversity of the Isididae, it's been revised to be called family Corrado Isididae um, to incorporate a lot of the, the new diversity that's been observed from deep water species. Nice. But this, this specimen won't, won't be used by just for, for her research. It'll actually also be used by uh, myself and colleagues who are working on environmental DNA uh, as a tool to understand biodiversity in this area. Oh, wow, look, we've got some, uh, got these things here. So these appear once in a while, these kind of brambles. So there's hydroids here, but also in this area have these, what look like uh, finger-like projections and we think those are actually defensive mechanisms that the bamboo coral employs to uh, surround potential um, irritants, uh, parasites. So you can see one case where they're live here. But basically, say they have anemone growing on the colony. They may send out these smaller sub-branches and form like a, a bramble around, around it? that parasite and kind of snuff it out. And so... Uh, yeah, that's always interesting to see those because they have, uh, they, you, know, you never know where they're going to appear, but they still kind of grow with polyps and nodes and everything. That's kind of cool. So it's a defensive mechanism. Yeah, possibly. Um, ready when you are, pilots. All right. So how old do you say this thing was? <laughs> uh, old enough, you don't want to knock it over. <laughs> thousand years. Uh, it, it, tough to tell, but I think you could probably make the case that uh, it's probably centuries. Centuries, yeah. wow. So all we need is a, a few centimeters off the top or somewhere around there. We don't want to take too much, just to confirm an ID. Roger. Some questions coming in about bamboo Can corals. Can what triggers a colony to create a new branch? That is a very easy question with a very difficult answer. Um, we don't know um, why they would branch at certain times of their life. So that's kind of the gist of, of Mary's research. But um, you know, we know that where they branch, you know, whether it's on a node or whether it's on an internode, the node being the uh, dark bands and the internode okay. being the calcium carbonate uh, white uh, calcium carbonate portion that's usually indicative okay, of can, having uh, you know right belonging along. to one species or another or sometimes one genus or another 
Zoom in for us, Tammy. Uh, go wide again, sorry. But looking back through my collections from the Okeanos Explorer and uh, Nautilus Cruises, this has never been collected in this area, so it'll be a great resource for uh, improving our species inventories for this area. about that one right there, Steve? Uh, yeah, that looks okay. Is there something on that branch? I can't quite see. Uh, is there like a brittle star or something? Yeah, do you not want that or do you? Uh, you can we zoom in just to see if it's uh, similar to the brittle stars that we've seen, yep. or the same species we've seen. Tilt up a bit more. Otherwise we want to avoid taking whole bits. Uh, doesn't look like it's a brittle star. It looks like it's some sort of growth on the coral itself. So I think we're go, we're go for that little branch. Yeah, I can get that one or the one to the left of yeah, it. Yeah, that, that's a that's a neat one because it actually has a branch point coming off. So yeah, if you could if you could get this this section right there, that'd be ideal. Right. Best of all worlds. That section right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, zoom in, Tim. It's a little too much zoom. Uh, go wide for a second. Sorry. Okay, zoom in again. Beautiful. Well, it came right off. Let's put that one in the forward box. Roger. If you're not, you can go away. But judging from, you know, for example, just the piece that we took off, it's it, it you could make an argument that's probably only that's maybe a few years of growth or maybe, you know, a decade of growth, depending on what growth rates are around here. So it's not like we're we're killing the whole colony with this uh, sample. We're just uh, sampling a little bit. Steve? Yep, so you can stow it. A, uh, left or right, does it matter? Doesn't matter. Fun fact about bamboo corals is uh, to some species mucus profusely, uh, sometimes more than the slime stars. Maybe not more than the slime stars. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, uh, the they will back. often produce copious amounts of mucus. We'll see if these produce them when they come up from the, the seafloor. Is that for our defense purposes? Yeah, we think Top so. Just a little on. Or when well, they're stressed out, they'll you know make mucus to. You know, clear their Those tissues if there's some sort of irritant or something. But it's usually a temperature triggered. I'm not sure if you heard me. Yeah, so it's probably awesome. why they're producing mucus from the shallows. It's just too hot. Okay, that's good. The temperature down there right now is uh, around 2 degrees C. Okay. Uh, two on. and a half, yep. Open. Good. Good. Mary and her colleagues looking uh, at the molecular the phylogeny of this group? Yeah. In part, yeah. So in context to the other uh, bamboo corals. Yeah. 
close and roll yeah, and open again. That's how you can usually determine species. You kind of compare <laughs> one genetic code okay, to all the known um, oh, come species on. of sequenced bamboo corals, and you can tell if this is different. Then you know maybe it's a, a unique species with unique branching characteristics. Okay, opening it. Somewhat. I think you got it. I think it's under now. Yep. Didn't want to smear it on the lid. up of the base or any other imagery? Yeah, we can do the quick base close-up and then uh, take off. And lasers, if you could, on near, uh, at or near the base. Right. This, yeah, right. we're going to fly away. viewers we are approximately halfway through our watch just wanted to give you an update on what we're doing um, just now we took a sample of a bamboo oh, coral so that would be bit. really helpful for our uh, scientists collaborators that are studying the sparse branching corals but yeah, and overall this dive we're exploring an unnamed seamount yeah. north of Kingman Reef our plan nope. was to go along a 4.6 kilometer transect upslope. Wants to see it, um, we're currently making our way upslope. Let me check Actually, on that one. Kind of looks like a triple nodal brancher uh, down at the base here. It almost looks like can't, you can't well tell the one in the background, but it looks like you have a triple triple node branch, which is actually pretty unusual, except in a few different genera. So I think this is a valuable collection. But you can see here, uh, illustrating on the telestrator here, the node, and then the internode, and then there's a node. It indicates the bamboo coral. All right, great, thanks. Ready to go. So when we see those nodes, it's bamboo coral. That's right. Oh. Yeah, it's the only family that has that. And sometimes the branches are at the nodes or in between the nodes. Yeah, but either or um, depend, and it, that that dictates uh, which you know genus it might belong to. Sweet. So that's what we're working on. Put in your questions. We want to hear from you. Well, there's a question coming in about our collections. Uh, why do we put the coral collections in the same box when sometimes we use separate containers? Is it is there something behind those choices? Yes, there are. Um, so oftentimes, you know, we only have so much space on the vehicle to put things. Um, so if if we only took uh, one sample per box, we would probably be one undersampling the site, and we would. Uh, uh, you know, have a lot of missed opportunities. Um, 
So what we do is we'll put multiple samples in the same box as long as they're very clearly differentiable. Um, so, you know, one bamboo coral is obviously not going to be mistaken for a plexorid, just the same as, uh, you know, maybe one rock, if it's well imaged, uh, might look very different from another rock. So we'll sometimes put uh, rocks together um, that look different or that can be distinguished. Bridge now. Two zero meters, bearing zero four five. Got viewers asking if we could see the telestration on channel one. Is that a possibility for them? Telestrator cannot go out on stream one. Stream one and two will never change. Never, ever, ever. can briefly, here and there, put the Telestrator possibly up on the th channel three. Okay. Or for the quad, I guess. Gotcha. Ship move underway. Science. That yeah. concludes our Rocky Alp crop portion of the watch. <laughs> uh, you are free to move towards any waypoint of your desire. We have of nothing, it. nothing on our sonar. <laughs> All right. Well, can we zoom out and high pack to take sure. a look at where we're headed? So, if we were to stay at this bearing, where would we end up? Waypoint nine. Okay. Um, great. Can we, um, so, can we maybe move a little bit towards the east of waypoint nine? Kind of up that ridge, you know what I'm talking about? Sure, like there? That's right. Great. Zero, five, zero then. Is this the one that's described as possible crater? That's what it looks like in the bathymetry. Um, on a high pack, it doesn't look like that, but I think there's something that's pretty clearly like a cone-shaped object in the vicinity of waypoint nine. What do you think? Oh, that? No, I was looking at, at this. So this is a waypoint nine here. Yeah. At least when I was planning the dive track, it there was a bit of a uh, cone zero zero. with like a, with like a crater in the middle. If you go forward there, you're going to go into the Goro you saw before. Bridge, no? I know. I'm just looking oh. around. Right. Try not to Tokyo drift into that spot. So now we're fixing to move. Probably a fair clip, so you'll want to stay in the Argus view, which I will okay. dial to zero five zero. We're gonna do zero five zero, are we, Sam? We are. I haven't put in that new ship move yet, so we're still at zero four five. How many people are tuning in right now, and from where? Ijana. Uh, two zero meters, bearing zero four five zero. You can. You can do a long move if you want. Zero five zero. <laughs> That's Argus looking uh, zero five zero. Okay. So, uh, heads up to the front row. Uh, sometime, you know, after we after we do this first move or so, I don't know if you want to do it on the fly, but we would like to take a Niskin sample over the sediment. And uh, what that will do will provide us kind of a, a control, a seafloor control for what we were sampling in our first Niskan sample at the bottom of that rocky slope. 
uh, which presumably has a lots of coral and sponge and environmental DNA we're interested in. In this area, since we don't see any, uh, it'll provide that kind of negative control. Another, another water sample coming up. To answer your previous question there, Jordan, who do we have uh, yep. tuning in? Yeah, we're, uh, we where's can, everyone uh, coming from? All right, so it looks like we have quite a few people joining us from the United States. Hello, and uh, a little bit further. Good morning. Yeah, maybe the end of the first move. People from Canada, hello and good morning. United Kingdom, hello and maybe good evening. <laughs> I should just say good day. Uh, um, Norway, Singapore, hello Norway and Singapore. Sweden, hello. Netherlands, hello. Italy, hello. Indonesia, huh. Finland, Germany, China, Switzerland, Australia, and Austria. We've got dots all over the world this morning. Thank you, global community, for tuning in and joining us on our exploration of an unexplored seamount north of Kingman Reef in the Central Pacific Ocean. So far, we've had the opportunity to collect both biological and geological samples to help further our understanding, the geological features at this site, and the biology and biodiversity. So for our watch, it's been a pretty, uh, pretty productive two hours. Science ROV, we've got uh, about seven meters left on this step. Do we want to pause for a Niskin or keep going? We can do it on the fly. Uh, on the fly. If Dan's happy with that. Bridge nav. Oh, okay. Five zero meters, zero five zero. Couple more shout outs. Hello from California. Good morning, California. Uh, Good day from Australia. Hello from South Africa and greetings from Germany. It's funny when you uh, said good day from Australia. I just, I heard that with the Australian accent in my head. <laughs> We're kind of cruising around here um, to our next waypoint. Question came in, does a coral start from just one polyp? And how do the polyps decide to space themselves out from each other? Very good question. And the uh, first answer is yes. Uh, they all start as a single polyp. Uh, as soon as the larvae settles, they'll start budding off polyps. And the spacing is dependent on a couple of things. Um, one, it's uh, kind of constrained by their growth as a species. So if, if uh, it's a particularly dense um, dense polyp species, that will dictate how many polyps per, you know, say, inch of branch there are, of polyps per centimeter. But there's also some um, really interesting Can research that Mr. suggests that uh, different um, corals might uh, have different polyp spacing, polyp density, polyp size, uh, based on the depth that they grow at. So if you were to take maybe one species of coral at 1,000 meters and one species of coral and the same species of coral at 2,000 oh, meters, fine. assuming they okay. well, they can Where both grow and live at those depths, okay. might have, have very <laughs> different um, uh, displays of polyp density and polyp size. So, oh, look. Cool. Uh, sponge. This well, hello, sponge. Fun. Yeah. Cool. Sponge. Thanks for that answer. Yeah. Of course. Well, the shrimp lives at the sponge house. OK. 
Okay. Yes, this is a. I'm gonna come back to Argus. Sponge. Uh, okay. You can zoom in on this sponge, Tammy. It's a glass sponge, but I don't know if I could catch it much further than that. So the glass sponges can grow on hard substrate and sediments. Yeah, yeah, they nice. have. Uh, so that. Do you want to try a porch leg? This one might might be a hyalinomatid, uh, so in that family hyalinomatidae. But uh, those that fa that particular family is most commonly observed on soft sediments like this, and they have these kind of fibrous roots. What? I'm not the end of my leash. It's basically yep. like, basically pure glass fibers. I wonder if there's any material science being done on these glass sponges. There is, uh, but I couldn't tell you much about it. I know that um, they've been looked at for their optical properties. Um, but uh, beyond that, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, oh. I know s some glass sponges have actually been looked at for their um, architectural strength. Was that something for them? Oh, no. Uh, there was actually a paper recently in a big journal, maybe it was Science or Nature, that talked about how um, certain glass sponge morphologies are the strongest, the strongest construction based on the fewest number of resources involved in creating that three-dimensional structure. So it's like the perfect, the perfect kind of architecture for the resources it's allotted. Yeah. That's interesting. I want to do a deeper dive on that. And look yeah, I'll try and find that paper. It was uh, it came out end of last year or so, maybe summer. They just seem like ideal candidates for material studies and yep. there are a lot of marine organisms that are studied in the realm of material science. Well, this is how this is how compressed time is in COVID era. Paper was actually from late 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that was just last year. Yeah, oh, that was two years ago. We were just talking about COVID time, like how it's melded into one. <laughs> like, do you remember what life was like pre-2020? <sighs> what? I do you remember what life was like pre-2020? I What life? <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's those two years that kind of, it's like one big cluster. <laughs> 2020, 2021. Oh, some more shout outs from Placerville, California. Thank first time watchers. Thank you so much for tuning in, Callie and Aaron. Oh, somebody's asking about uh, potential research into the chemistry and glue that some of the sponges use. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm definitely interested after seeing these on this expedition, um, doing some more research and finding out what studies have been done in the last couple of years, looking at various material properties. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely an area for some hot research. Um, you know, the, there's a new whole field. Well, it's, I guess it's not not new. It's been ongoing for a while. But, you know, now that we're exploring the deep sea with more regularity, the concept of deep sea natural products um, or products that are produced by animals in the deep sea that might have other applications uh, that could be, you know, maybe they could be synthesized or, um, or or modified in a way that, uh, you know, they can be used for human needs on land. This includes things like, um, you know, structural products like those, you know, maybe adhesives or or uh, things like that, or maybe even compounds that might be useful in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we refer to those as natural products, um, but. 
it's important to remember that those natural products are produced using uh, information from the animal's genetic code. So all of those ways to formulate those compounds are found in uh, DNA. The instruction book. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I think there, a lot of that work has been done in the reef building corals realm. I know when I was in graduate school, there were two labs dedicated at UC Santa Barbara that were studying uh, the potential for natural products in reef building coral reef environments. So, A couple of years ago, uh, yeah, I was out on uh, Nautilus with a team out of Scripps um, who was uh, doing some research about... Um, biopharmaceutical properties of certain products that chemicals and sponges and microbes might produce in the California borderlands. We were, we were out uh, for two, three weeks or so on Nautilus sampling corals. So we had a, a geneticist on board who uh, specialized in those things um, and as well as his lab. So it was a really concerted effort. It was a NOAA Ocean Exploration funded project as well. But nice. great team. Uh, Lisa Levin, uh, chief scientist uh, on that cruise, and uh, Paul Jensen, I think was his name, He's the natural products scientist. Also had uh, Greg Rouse, taker of extremely amazing polykey images. Uh, oh, just earlier we had a polykey fan on the live stream. Yep. <laughs> If you, uh, if you like Balakeets, check out his new book. Not to, to plug it, but I, I do want to copy myself, <laughs> go, honestly. Go ahead and plug it. What's the, um, what year was it published? Just recently, I think this year. It's called um, Analita is the name of the book. I'm going on Amazon right now. Let's put it's that on my uh, wish just list. Just double check because time is a blur. Are we sure it's this year? <laughs> it's definitely this year. <laughs> It may be end of last year, but, you know, the deliveries of the book started this year, but it's it's a it's a it's a bit of a tome, uh, but it has amazing, amazing photos of polychaetes. Oh, it's on pre-order, so. Okay, not quite out yet. Huh. I love. Um, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. That was me looking at the price. <laughs> 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 but um, I love collecting books that have captured images of organisms in the deep. Yeah. And here we are providing images of organisms from the deep in real time. So yep. maybe I can uh, let go of my book collection and and be mindful and be present <laughs> today. There's just so many things, so many questions to be asked, and so much information to be gained on every single expedition um, through every image and every discovery. It's just it's, it, it keeps it exciting for sure. This, uh, actually last year, I helped contribute to a book chapter that hopefully is coming out this year on uh, deep water coral reefs of the world um, mm. and with a chapter specifically focusing on the Pacific Islands, Hawaii. Um, so we, we put that together using uh, a bunch of collaborators uh, and hoping that it uh, finally comes out. Uh, I think they were just waiting for the last few chapters to get submitted and edited, but should be it's through review at least, and uh, hopefully to come out later this year. Since we're plugging our books, I have a book coming out later this year as well, <laughs> specifically um, for kids, a children's book on engineering and the deep sea. Awesome. I'm just going to throw it all out there. I'll, I'll, I'll add it to my Amazon uh, there you go. request list. Yeah. <laughs> La end of last year, we had uh, an SCF out um, who gave me a bunch of uh, books on a, a recommended reading list for you know, four to six-year-olds and uh, definitely got a few of them for the holidays. We're still m working our way through them. Will you look at this uh, urchin here? Trucking it. <laughs> 